the Cold War uh, at that wonderful conference that you put on in late 2015. Um, and you see, of course, is not only the author of Pax Transatlantica, which I'm going to keep holding up, um, in part because I think it's got a really crackerjack cover, uh, but also the author of works like The Flawed Architect, about, about Henry Kissinger and American foreign policy, the rise and fall of detente. I see some faces from the American Grand Strategy Seminar uh, who were all reading UC's work on detente uh, on Monday afternoon. Um, and uh, most recently this, Pax Transatlantica, uh, America and Europe in the post-Cold War era, uh, which is out from Oxford University Press and available for purchase wherever books are sold. Uh, so first of all, welcome, Yusi. Thank you for being here uh, and for making the arduous Zoom journey to be with us here in, in North Carolina. Thank you very much, Simon. It's uh, it's great to be um, with you. I wish I was actually in physically. I've actually never visited Duke, so it'd be great to to actually be there physically. But uh, but times are tough, so uh, so we'll have to make do it like this. But but yes, thank you very much for the invitation. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to discuss uh, transatlantic relations with all of you. Well, we'll look forward to welcoming you, welcoming you in person when that's that's allowed, uh, which is hopefully sooner uh, rather than later. So first, I wanted to ask you uh, to talk a bit about what motivated you to take on this subject. Um, and I'm thinking about that in kind of two angles. Uh, first of all, as a historian, uh, what made you mo what motivated you to tackle this much more contemporary and also forward looking? Uh, project. Uh, and second, I'm kind of curious as someone, you know, based in Europe, but not the European Union, uh, Europe, but not NATO, um, a little bit about how you kind of see uh, that issue, how you've, how you've come to think of it uh, before you embarked on this project. So a little backstory. Sure. Um, so, the, yeah, I, I realize this is a contemporary topic, and 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 of course the danger of, of writing a book like this it doesn't have a real ending point in in a way that the chronology is ongoing. And so one of the problems with that is that when you finish the the thing and then you send it off, you know that within weeks something that should be there is not going to be there. Uh, has happened that that should be there and hasn't so so that, that that's the danger but um but I, I i think there's really two things that that sort of as a historian i guess uh got me into into thinking about writing a book like this number one is is the is it's the sort of the idea that there's something wrong in transatlantic relations always that there's a crisis that uh and, and after the crisis there's a resolution and then there's a new crisis and a new crisis and a new crisis and it's it's that sort of um for a relationship like this 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 sort of crisis mentality that's so pervasive about the transatlantic relationships that i've sort of through my professional career since leaving finland in and going coming to study in the united states and then i've sort of had this transatlantic experience for the last three some decades and I've just every year there is a crisis in transatlantic relations whether it's about a military intervention that uh, somewhere like the Iraq war for example or something like that whether it's an economic issue whether it's um, it's a um, some politician saying nasty things about you know countries on the other side of the Atlantic either way and uh, there's been crises like this uh, always. And the way we treat this crisis is as though the sky is going to fall. That everything is now coming to an end. And I think even COVID was uh, certainly a year ago. Um, it was adding more pressure to, you know, clo border, uh, border closures and so forth, which, which were not just an American phenomenon, but was across Europe and, and so forth created even more of that. So... I've been wondering, well, you know, is what is this crisis, and and is it just part of the normal relationship that actually is on a very fundamentally in a very sound basis, 
And so trying to tease that out, that there was one motive I'm sort of getting frustrated with, with this crisis talk. The second thing, um, as a, more as a historian, is that there seems to be also in more recent years, this idea that the Cold War period was some kind of a golden age when it comes down to transatlantic relations. And then after that, everything has gone to, you know, the proverbial hell in a handbasket and, and, and all the rest of it. And I wanted to challenge that and, and think about all the Cold War crises. Perhaps, you know, we've had this same pattern uh, across time uh, for, for even longer than just the last uh, last 30 years that, that are really the focus focus of the book. So those were really the, the two, two things that I wanted to sort of think about. Are these crises just actually useful for the transatlantic relationship? And, you know, has something fundamentally changed in the transatlantic relationship since the, since the end of the Cold War? So I want to pick up on the point of the perennial crisis, right? That the crisis mm -hmm. is an annual event. Um, it's it's almost the default state. Um, and ask, you know, as someone who's thought, uh, you know, seriously and deeply about this arc of history, how do you explain that kind of perennial chicken littleism uh, about transatlantic <clears throat> relations? Because it does seem to me that there's something distinctive there in how maybe not crisis prone, but crisis outcry prone, um, that particular relationship corridor, what have you, tends to be. Do you have a, what's your sense of why that's the case? Um, I think the easiest explanation to me seems to be the simplest one, which is that these are democracies. And they practice democratic politics. And democratic politics work only as long as there is disagreement. Uh, when disagreement stops, then something's gone really wrong. And I think that in at some level, I think that you can ex extrapolate that sort of uh, that, that kind of idea to then the relationships among democracies um, that makes um, you know makes disagreement sort of the natural part of the conversation uh, and, and, and deal making and, 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 and so forth this is, is only natural for the, for the transatlantic relationship. And then when you add on top of that, the sort of asymmetries that exist in the relationship, which is of course the United States being the, the traditional juggernaut in this, uh, the big guy in the whole, uh, whole relationship, the, you know, and, and then the Europeans, uh, smaller and unable to really unite into a kind of a real sort of a, a super super state as uh, un, under the European Union. So I think that sort of that continuous um, mix of democratic politics and then having in effect not just two sides to the to the matter, but thirty or so um, that that makes for you know, a potentially very volatile <laughs> set of relationships. And yet it's also something that just um, doesn't escalate to a point of, as, at least so far, doesn't escalate to a point of a, uh, a sort of a divorce in a, in, in a sense. So I found this book, um, in addition to being really enjoyable to read, and um, also I should mention to, to potential customers, um, a really compact read. It's, it's a fast read, it's engaging. Um, it, there is not a, a preponderance of pages. Um, I, I wonder, I found it sort of provocatively reassuring uh, in that, as you just talked about, uh, the, the fad is panic. Right, the fashion is to say, well, this is it, right? Whether that was when Charles de Gaulle pulled uh, France out of the NATO military unified military command in the '60s, or when Donald Trump, you know, kind of hip checked uh, the Prime Minister of Montenegro uh, in 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 the at the his first uh, NATO summit, there is a, a tendency towards, as you say. Um, and framing everything as crisis. You frame rather events uh, as a continuity, 
uh, and B, you have a very optimistic outlook for, of the, for the future. Um, so you're not saying the sky is falling. Um, mm -hmm. You're saying that the sky is really solidly up there. Um, it was well framed, passed all the inspections. Um, you know, it's it's really durable. Um, I say this because I'm in the middle of a renovation project, and so I'm thinking a lot about county inspections right now. Um, so, so talk to us about your your argument. Your, as I said, refreshing but provocatively reassuring argument in the book. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. In brief, we can go go into detail, but but number one, let me let me just assure everybody also that as a historian, I'm I'm allergic to prediction in a sense that I could I've learned as a historian to be very humble about predicting what's going to happen next. So I don't know for sure. Okay, so so number one, that that is I don't know what's going to happen next week, um, and you know, and and so forth. So it's very possible that that uh, something totally unexpected and, and, and so forth will indeed happen. Now, if that is not the case, then what reassures me about the specifics of the transatlantic relationship, and I should say that most of the book really doesn't, doesn't talk, I'm not analyzing the sort of the external aspects of the transatlantic relationship in a sense that the threats out there and 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 how the west would fit into the is it in decline and 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 and, and all that that's not really what the book is about it's more about how this relationship over time the last 30 years the focus of the book but one could I think go back to, to the end of World War II and sort of start the trajectory there. We've seen um, increasing security ties across the Atlantic. And in the last 30 years, in the form of NATO, in the last 30 years, we've seen NATO grow exponentially in terms of its membership and change somewhat not totally in terms of its uh, its its rationale its missions and it has gone out of area in the last 20 years for the first time with the agreement of those 30 countries that not that today today compose compose nato that is that i know it's a fact but the reality is this is at the moment this seems to be the world's most successful military alliance in in, in in history. Uh, and I don't see the threats that are there for the NATO alliance, for example, where there is questions about burden sharing, you know, it's going to be 2.1% or 1.9% and so forth. I don't see those as terminal. Uh, and they've been perennial. And there's been movement a little bit this way, a little bit that way, and so forth. So those I don't think will be will be the block or the, or the, the sort of the um, the thing that will break down this relationship. Second, I'm, I'm sort of thinking about the economics of all of this, in which case you often focus on, on things like uh, protectionism, tariffs, you know, uh, and, and so forth, without realizing how well connected the transatlantic marketplace, so I call it the transatlantic economic space, actually is. Um, that it's true that we haven't seen big major trade deals like the TTIP that sort of fell off the rails a bit and maybe it's being a little bit revived today. But at the same time, we've seen that trade in, in goods, in services, investment, the, uh, the digital marketplace and all of these things have sort of grown and, and pulled the, the two sides of the Atlantic together in a way that, that this is the transatlantic space is the wealthiest marketplace in the world. And it is also connected with similar concerns on both sides of the Atlantic. The economies look remarkably same on a sort of macro level in terms of where they are uh, in, term, in the sort of post-industrial stage at the moment. So that thing. And then the, the one thing that I, I found <clears throat> I found hopefully most provocative is, is this whole question about politics, internal politics. And 
where I've seen over the last 30 years, and we talk a lot about, oh, these populist leaders at this, and this is the end of, end of all things. What actually the rise of populism in the last decade or so, what's the most interesting aspect for me is how it's happened simultaneously not day-to-day -day simultaneous, but roughly in the same uh, chronological manner on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, that, um, and, and that tells me something about, again, I think we can explain it as a sort of, simply, simply we can explain that people on the two sides of the Atlantic have similar kinds of concerns. And hence, they're looking for similar kinds of answers from the political sphere, which means that populism suddenly became attractive in the aftermath of the Great Recession of, of 2007-2008. And it perhaps meant also that it, back in the 1990s, um, the so what was some called the third way, or what was sort the of New Democrats or New Labour in Britain and, and so forth, rose to prominence roughly in the in, in the same era as a sort of similar similar search for answers and that actually i think is is a post called for post called for phenomenon to, to a large extent you don't see that kind of political similarity at the same time so what i conclude from all of that all of this basically is that that the, the institutional and, and security links are strong the economic ties are strong and also the economic concerns, sort of macro concerns about, you know, say China and so forth are similar, not identical, but similar on the two sides of the Atlantic. And that people in, behave politically in remarkably similar ways on both sides of the Atlantic. And so these are the types of bonds that I don't think can be easily uh, erased by one politician or another saying, uh, calling something obsolete or brain dead or whatever it might be. Which is likely to happen in the near future again, I'm sure. And what those those quotes are attributable to what Donald Trump and Emmanuel Macron respectively? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Macron is the one responsible for brain dead, right? That's right. Yes, that's, yes, he's uh... That's my that's my recollection that he that was yeah. that was his gem. I want to talk about Macron and, and and strategic European strategic autonomy a term that he's mm -hmm. been using a lot in a second. I I I thought maybe we could talk through the kind of three big issues, the security, economics and politics. Mm -hmm. Um so so let's start with 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 Macron's kind of idea of European security uh, security autonomy because it it strikes to me that he's using language uh, which is designed to say that the United States is not a European power. Um, I'm I'm reminded, per, uh, you know, as a, as a historian, I'm reminded of all of Gorbachev's Mikhail Gorbachev, the Soviet leader's language about a common European home. Uh, right to which the the implicit message in a lot of that is that the United States does not have you know keys uh, to the to set to set home. So how do you see the language about European strategic autonomy, which is uh, coming primarily out of France but not exclusively out of France, um, in this in this context of the Pax Transatlantica, um, not only in the present but also perhaps in the future. Yeah, <clears throat> that's uh, obviously an uh, a essential question, I think, in terms of, of, of ongoing debates and discussions uh, right now. And, and I think the, the sort of the Trump presidency certainly, uh, I wouldn't say lightened up, but it, it certainly mixed the bag in terms of it, it created a lot more um, interest in, in this particular discussion, certainly in, in, in Europe, the, the whole notion about unpredictability of of America's role in Europe and I, I think it's since he lost the election it's sort of a little bit relaxed but but to, to, to the point um, a couple of things number one the, this this the notion about European strategic autonomy or a Europe 
Europe defended by Europeans, I guess, in, in, to, to put it in, in, in other terms. Obviously, it's not new. It's not Macron's idea. You mentioned the goal, for example, um, before Gorbachev. We can even, even go back, of course, go further back to, to the European defense community idea back in 1950 and, and, and so forth. It's something that has been there all along uh, throughout NATO's history, in fact, if, uh, if you do that. And it is something that arguably the United States has either promoted or, or put some brakes on. Um, but there hasn't been a very clear, you know, it's something that, that, that certainly, I mean, that's whole, the whole point about defense spending, of course, is that Europeans should spend more and do more and so forth, but not leave NATO necessarily that's that's the that's the footnote in 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 this i think it's it's going to um now because of this long history um that's one of the reasons i don't see this as becoming or, or that there it this there will be some kind of a immediate point of decision where you have to say no you know americans home uh, this is europe and and that's it i don't think that is anywhere in the in the near future uh, going to happen um, because Europeans have a hard time pulling together a credible, um, realistic uh, European sort of uh, defense community idea or, <clears throat> or strategic autonomy, as, as you put it, um, that, that would, would be acceptable to all. Um, in, and again, in part because you can look for historical roots, but I, I think the role that the United States has traditionally played since World War II in Europe has been mainly actually that, <clears throat> that old, um, old, old uh, NATO, uh, NATO quip about NATO being created you know, to keep the Americans in, the Russians out, and the Germans down. Uh, and there's some doubt one might add that some Europeans keeping the French down as well wouldn't be so bad, right? So, so I think that is that, that's uh, that's part of it. The fact that we are dealing with these, you know, twenty-eight countries in NATO from Europe, basically, that that would have to join forces and come to an agreement. Um, but would it be a French-led European defense? community would that be acceptable to 20 some countries probably not would that be and, and probably not because many wouldn't consider it credible at this point at, at least and that's where the united states comes in um and and in fact the more um and i think this is where one has to also bring into the element of um you know why was nato created in the first place and they still have that same rationale to some extent it does and and the takeover of crimea made it very clear that there is still some concern there should be some concern perhaps uh on that and i, I think that is where um you know vladimir putin did a did a great service to those who wish for the United States to continue being, as you put it, the European power. So let me pick up right on that point about Russia, uh, because as as you just said, and you and you, you say this in the in the book, um, that that NATO, in light of Russian aggression, uh, is more and more relevant as a security actor vis-a-vis -vis Russia, uh, in particular. Uh, but some would say, uh, and I, I, I don't subscribe to this view, but some would say that it's also a driver of that insecurity uh, by having expanded eastward, moved into, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm really hesitant to start talking about Russian sphere of influence with a fin, uh, but, but moving into what the Russians, some in Russia consider to be um, their sphere of privileged interests, to use their, uh, their nomenclature, expanding, uh, you know, all post the post Cold War years. So how do you square that circle of, of on the one hand, NATO as kind of especially relevant as a security actor? And also NATO as perceived by many in Europe, and there are polls, for example, in Germany, 
that, that endorse this view as the driver of that very insecurity. Mm. Yeah. So one of the things I actually spend some time in, in the book is discussing the, the immediate post, post-Cold War situation and, and, and what's now, now, now what sort of in terms of, of the security institutions that existed. The Warsaw Pact was finished, obviously. Um, the Soviet Union soon was no more. Um, and so, of course, the obvious question many asked, and George Kennan wrote quite a bit about at the time and, and, and ever since, um, was who needs NATO, right? And I think the answer was relatively clear at in the 19 became relatively clear in the 1990s that it's it's not so much um the the enlargement and the, the continuity of of nato into the future was guaranteed not so much by russian behavior in the 1990s but rather by the historical memory of the countries that had yes been part of the Warsaw Pact and had not perhaps joined in that pact quite so out of their free will, so to speak. So the first three countries, obviously, that, that do join in, in the 1990s, Poland, Hungary, and, and, and Czechoslovakia, you know, these are countries that two of them had were faced with the Warsaw Pact or Soviet intervention. Uh, during the Cold War and the third one, Poland, almost, you know, martial law and all this in the 1980s, as you well know. And, and so, you know, we had, we had that, that situation. So these countries are, in a sense, voting on their feet. Their main concern is, is um, security concern is in the East. And it's, it was, at, I think, in the 1990s, very difficult. And there's a lot of sort of diplomatic... Um, acrobatics and so forth from the Clinton administration at the time in trying to explain to their Russian counterparts that this is not against you. And, uh, but, but the Poles and the Czechs and the Hungarians certainly thought it was against Russia. But these were democracies and, and they, they're, they're, um, the, um, their acquisition, their, their sort of um, NATO membership was um, was of course a trigger for other type of further enlargement than in the 2000s, which, which then meant that all the former Warsaw Pact countries became NATO members, aside from, from Russia, obviously, and, and uh, including the, and some sp former parts of the Soviet Union became NATO members in, in, in the Baltic states. So, so there was something attractive in NATO, I think, rather than of putting that explains the, the enlargement. Now, how that is viewed in Russia is something else. And, and that's, I, I don't get into that so much in, in the book itself, but my guess is that, that, that um, there is an open debate in the United States. There was in the 1990s an open debate about NATO enlargements, NATO's continuity and so forth. And it is very easy to sort of find two sides in that debate. So it's no wonder that, of course, the Russian perspective is not particularly positive about NATO's longevity and then its enlargement and, and so forth. So yes, of course, they are natural allies uh, uh, in, in, in that sense, uh, those who are arguing that actually NATO enlargement provokes more than it secures but um, ultimately those who should be asked more about this are not the russians are not the americans but the countries that actually vote to join to apply and join uh, the nato alliance what is the rationale i think the rationale is a concern about security and security being the sort of the first necessary um, step towards a functioning democracy and, uh, and, and and so forth so so yeah um and and so i'm, I'm not saying that that russia that the argument that that nato provokes some russian actions is not logical i think it's perfectly logical i don't think it's um 
but I don't think it it sort of justifies. I don't know the Ukraine or, or, or conflict in in the uh, in the um, I mean the Crimea conflict in the Ukraine and 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 so. Forth. So let's talk a little about the economic element, um, yeah. and and you frame uh, you know very in very strong terms the importance economically of uh, the transatlantic sort of economic space, if you will, um, and and I, I I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you see this vis-a-vis uh, -vis the rise of China as an important economic actor. Um, do, you, do you see that as, as jeopardizing that kind of privileged position or how do you see those two processes uh, interacting now? Um, and of course in the past as well, but also in the future. Um, so there's a couple of points may, maybe, maybe to underline. I think you, all right. I mean, the big economic story globally in since the end of the Cold War has obviously been China's rise into number two, number one, or however we, 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 we want to look at it now. And, and that's been a remarkable story. It's been a remarkable success uh, from the Chinese perspective, certainly. And it's also been, I think, a remarkable sex for, a success for the overall global economy. But it has also wrought significant change in how that global economy functions and who has who does what, what's whose role is, is what in that economy. What's happened for the transatlantic space is basically that they are the biggest import source of imports in terms of industrial goods is China, both for the United States and for the European Union. And so that's the number one thing just to keep in mind that, that that's so so we are buying stuff from china um in 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 ever increasing numbers so so to speak however that's sort of how and that's one similarity the other thing to remember is that in terms of exports the european union's primary export market outside of the union is the united states so it's north america uh, and that works the other way around China is not buying our goods, so to speak. Uh, not that, and that overall, that sort of the, the the market of industrial goods has diminished, relatively speaking, in terms of the size of the overall economy. At the same time, the significance of services has grown, and there China's role is minimal, slightly growing, but it's minimal compared to United States or North America, Europe. Again, the Intra services trade across the Atlantic is massive compared to anything outside of the transatlantic space. And probably most important is, is the sort of the investments, the foreign di direct investment. China is not a tar is not a big investor. It is not for Europeans, for Americans. Yes, it is the in Europeans and Americans invest more in China to in, in the 21st century than than in the past. However, by far the largest investment target for American investors outside of the United States is Europe and Europeans in America. And that, of course, I mean, that's sort of, that's why I, I think this is an economic space, because it is so closely knit. When you invest in, you know, when investing in another country, you pretty much are sure that your investment is not going next morning going to be a, a casualty of a sudden political upheaval or, or something like that. And I think that is, is where it is. So, so that means what well, that means in terms of China um, is that unless the structure of the Chinese economy changes significantly, um, it will remain in the near future, at least, the sort of source of industrial goods and all kinds of goods and there's no question about that but that is not what i would call sort of economic integration in the same way as when you talk about long-term investment when you talk about um, you know when you're starting you know setting up subsidiaries and so forth in an other on another continent providing creating jobs in that other continent and, and so forth which is very much the pattern in uh, in in the transatlantic economy 
they will face, they will ultimately, of course, also face. China represents the same kind of potential menace, I guess, in, in, um, for, for both the Europeans and, and the Americans. So um, dependency, the dependency is the same. The dependency on Chinese industrial goods is significant. And I think that's, that's where the cooperation, that, that will demand actually more cooperation from the European Union and the United States than, rather than less because it's a common problem, it's a common challenge that, that they will have to face. So uh, continuing on the economic theme, but also I, I want to kind of bridge the economics and politics themes of the book mm -hmm. um, and, and, and ask a little bit about populism. Um, and uh, I, I, re I really enjoyed your, uh, your argument about the kind of the other side of what this, this populist let's say populist challenge kind of tells us about the transatlantic space as a, as a community. Um, but it seems to me fair to say that a big part of populism is protectionism. That a big part of populism is a skepticism about free trade. You mentioned the end of the Trans-Pacific, uh, the of TTIP. <clears throat> um, I, I'm also thinking about the Trans-Pacific Partnership as well. Um, here in the United States, it wasn't just the sort of avowed populist Donald Trump in 2016, who was very bearish on free trade. Hillary Clinton didn't have many nice things to say about TPP and TTIP either. And I think that was true in 2020, where Donald Trump repeated his trade, free trade skepticism. Uh, and Joe Biden was certainly no champion um, of it either. So how do you see the kind of populist, political, and economic protectionist uh, impulses interacting uh, in the transatlantic space? Mm -hmm. The, um, the, the, yeah, I, think, I mean, you have a, it's an excellent point. I, I think it's always going to be Put it another way, it's always going to be necessary for an aspiring politician to promise they're going to keep the jobs. I think that is a sort of inevitable logic of, of democratic politics, whether you're in the United States, the UK, uh, France, Finland, wherever you are. This You have to promise, I mean, these are your voters, these are the people you're accountable for ultimately. Uh, and so... It, it will require um, a degree of at least promises and, and offers and so forth. And that's why I think, I think what, what the real sort of thing that comes from that, I don't think, and, and you're absolutely right also in saying it's not just the populists, it's, it's also, you know, it's, it's just, you know, um, I remember when I was a kid in, in the 1970s and there was a whole campaign in Finland, you have to, to, to buy Finnish made goods. That was, you know, important because that way, you know, you secure some jobs and, and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that, that's sort of only, only, only natural. I think it, um, it is probably the reason why um, there hasn't been, it's, it's much more difficult to conclude a massive, massively comprehensive economic agreement between the European Union and the United States, the, the TTIP, for example, that it is, it's very, very difficult to sell something that, that really sort of ties all of this into one one agreement although you know economic economists would point out to you that you know actually there's a lot of jobs in it there's profits in it you know the, you know there will be growth in it and, and so forth it is very difficult in the short term for any politician um, no matter what uh, political persuasion they may be to to actually sell that and translate the argument that TTIP is cool or something like that into votes. That's almost almost impossible, I think, in, in, in this day and age. Which is why I think the economy. I don't, but the second point I want to make about this is that that doesn't mean they won't that this will be uh, the end 
if you can't make that big deal, it doesn't mean the end of the transatlantic economic relationship as and this is part of the, the I was in the beginning talking about the crisis crisis scenarios and crisis literatures when you know when they pulled the TTIP or pushed it aside it was sort of you know crisis 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 this is the end of the end of something um, not necessarily because I think it doesn't mean that there will not be more incremental progress uh, in the economic regime, you know, the investment flows don't suddenly just fall because there's no big agreement. They might increase dramatically if there was some big deal, but they don't, they're not just going to fall off the cliff if, if you don't reach, reach a deal. So in, in that sense, I think the, what you're saying about economics and politics, I think you're absolutely right. They're closely connected and, you know, populism became what it the, the big thing it did in part because of the great recession which was blamed on this globalization and you know all all, all this ttip talk and, and and so forth did not go well with that uh, in, in that in that context so so there's no no question that uh, that, that that the link isn't there um but it is also and I mean, one of the points I make in the in the book, for example, is the economies are so close that you know we rise and fall together. Basically, when the economy in you know the transatlantic economic space, Europe and North America, economies tend to go up and then suffer decline roughly at the same time. Usually, the United States leading the pack, but not uh, not always. So, so yeah, I don't think. Um, and because I think the future and the past has always been about incremental, uh, incremental process, uh, progress. Sorry, um, I think there's been plenty of announcements about the new transatlantic agenda in the 1990s and all that. It hasn't created a big, major, com comprehensive agreement, and I don't think it's going to do that. Um, but there's, I, I still see them, that 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 there's no no politician and we've seen that that is going to be able to totally torpedo and turn the clock back into some kind of a 1930s harley tar harley smooth tariff type scenario in the near future so i want to get one last question in mm -hmm. but i want to encourage everyone uh, to start raising your sort of virtual hands, your digital hands um, now, and then and then I'll, I'll work my way down the list um, after 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 I exercise chair's prerogative and get just one last question in because I find the uh, the issue of you know the rise of populism in Europe uh, not only you know very interesting as a historian um, and someone who's interested in current events. Uh, but also in many ways, you know, quite worrying um, and, and honestly, in many ways, quite disappointing. Um, I think especially in Eastern European states, and I'm, I'm a Slovak citizen, um, it, it seems to me that there was a lot of promise uh, in the post-Cold War world, which is not being fulfilled or realized. And I imagine that if uh, those politicians were here, they would say, um, yeah, it wasn't fulfilled, and that's why the people want this. Um, but I wanted to get your uh, your assessment of, of the durability of that. So you talked about we rise together, we fall together. Um, and uh, while I agree that the, the winning political argument is not, yes, free trade might cause you pain, but in the aggregate, it's good uh, because you can't eat in the aggregate, um, doesn't pay your mortgage. Uh, we've, or, well, I mean, it can, um, but we've got uh, maybe some good news recently. Uh, Austria's chancellor of a populist bent has resigned. Uh, the, the very populist kind of billionaire Czech prime minister um, has been defeated at the polls. Uh, the most recent German elections were not a good uh, election for the populist, uh, uh, very right wing, um, quite overtly racist uh, alternative for Deutschland. Uh, party. So I like your contrarian take, but I guess what I wonder 
about populism is, and so I'm probably going to get in trouble for this choice of language, but it's the one that comes to my mind. Um, you know, parasites need hosts until they deprive, until they they kill the host. Um, and in populism, I think it's a really interesting insight that uh, it circulates around the European community, but I haven't heard Viktor Orban say much good stuff about that European community, quite the opposite. Um, ditto his counterparts in Poland. And of course, Boris Johnson, who's kind of on the more saw, I think it's fair to say, the more soft kind of respectable end of populism, um, of course, kind of made his political bones um, as, as a Euro skeptic. So, um, as Professor Hanamaki answers, please get those hands up. But I, I wonder just your, your sense uh, of, of the populism issue going forward. Is there grounds for optimism? Um, not if you are in a supporter of populist parties, then no. <laughs> That's my short answer. What I would say is, um, but in terms of the themes of the book, I think this is actually, and, and all, the, all the examples you just listed, I, I think what we are seeing as, at the moment, and I think may, this may have in fact in part have been brought on by, by COVID, I don't know, um, but in the last few years, and certainly since the defeat of Donald Trump, in the last November's presidential election, you've seen the sort of incredible shrinking of, of a number of populist movements and, and, and parties. I think you're going to see the, in the UK right now, we see the all kinds of problems emerging that they're hidden and you know, when the COVID things were, were, were on top of it, but now we're seeing all kinds of supply chain issues and, and, and delivery problems that are related to Brexit, the great victory of, of, uh, of, of Boris Johnson and, and that type of, of populism. So. I think that's um, that's the sort of the anti-populist moment. I think is here. Will it last? It will be replaced by some. And I think is 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 sort of on both sides of the Atlantic. I, I wouldn't be too too worried. And again, I'm not in the United States, and I haven't been able to come for a while. But and so my my pulse is not exactly on the on on the political. <laughs> Uh, thermometer there, but <clears throat> but oh, I can't can't fully sort of grasp everything. But I wouldn't be too worried about sort of um, um, what you what you sometimes mistakenly or for whatever reason call Trumpism, um, which is um, uh, you know basically if it's a one man show, it's not going to last much longer. If it's something else, it probably is. I mean, at least. Like you said, the hosts were there waiting. So, um, so, so maybe, maybe something, something more durable uh, than than just um, just one guy. Um, now, the uh, just one one other thing, if I if I may, but sort of related. I think a lot of this, I wouldn't be overconfident about that sort of anti-populist moment. It's it's unlikely to be a permanent anything but i think one should take heart of the fact that that no matter no matter what um the um so the populist movements rarely have actually gained power in in democracies that you mentioned victor orban well there is an ex example but it's relatively speaking exceptional if they have it hasn't lasted for that long um because but of course, populism is bigger than as a phenomenon, since it is bigger than the uh, what we call populists today. But it's a phenomenon transcending centuries, if not not millennia. So, so we are talking about basically a, a, a way of gaining power, and then the governing part can be, you know, that can lead to all sorts of problems, as 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 we have seen even in 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 in, in the United States. Yes, it's a much different uh, undertaking to be in opposition uh, than to oh, yes. than to actually have to just oh, yes. make the trains run on time. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I, I have a lot more questions I want to ask, but I'm going to mm -hmm. uh, exercise a modicum of self-control uh, and, and open it up to the audience. And I see Benjamin Jackson uh, is the first up to, to pose a question. Hey, yeah, this is uh, Ben Jackson dialing in from the National Defense University down in uh, Fayetteville. Uh, my question uh, relating to, you know, kind of what you're talking about, the chinks in the Warsaw Pact's uh, armor being those Eastern Bloc states that ended up joining NATO at, you know, the end of the Cold War. Um, from your perspective, uh, how do you view, and I know there's some tenuous relations with, with Turkey right now, but uh, how do you view Turkey right now? And, you know, it, while they still are a part of NATO and participating in NATO operations, looking towards you know, purchasing uh, Russian-made anti-aircraft weapons and stuff like that. Do you see that's a potential weakness in the uh, transatlantic pact, specifically uh, NATO as an organization? How does that kind of fall out in your, your studies? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, Turkey has always had this rather unique role in, in terms of, of NATO. It's it's one of the few countries that can do war with another NATO country. So Greece is the other one that's gone war with Turkey, of course. And 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 so it's one of those um, one of those internal um, internal uh, perhaps eternal, I, I might say, uh, uh, clashes. But so in terms of um, Turkey's current um, situation. I think Erdogan and, and his government obviously is is not the government that is particularly popular um, among member states of the European Union or or um, you know elites uh, elites there. And I, I think the fact that there's been these purchases from Russia is is is, is not raising his. Um, his stock, so to speak, uh, across NATO. Now, that said, um, I think what we do see, what I, I think is, is more likely than, uh, it is a, in some ways a weakness, but in some ways, of course, it, it is just Turkey also presents a particular kind of strength and did added strength, added value, if you will, to the NATO alliance, in that it is the one Middle East, Middle East, Middle Eastern state in that in that alliance. Uh, it is the one that, uh, as a consequence, faces very different kinds of security challenges sometimes than, say, Portugal or or or, or Norway or you know a number of other. Other member states of the of of the of the NATO alliance, and because of that, um, uh, Turkey sometimes also in the past has been on its in in its own path. But I wouldn't say that that is necessarily a particular weakness for for the NATO alliance as uh, as such. And I don't see, um, I don't. I think it's certain, I would call it more opportunism on the part of the current Turkish government um, that um, that they see um, and, and also a way of sort of expanding their security possibilities of, of, of in terms of, of cooperation. And it may also be in some way uh, a game that is meant to extract something from well, what we still sometimes call the West um, in, in, in some circles. So I hope that answers part of your question. Please. Thanks, you see, let's go to Francis. Better turn on your mic, Francis. It was just, it wasn't unmuting me, but it's good now. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so my question, we were talking a lot about populists and even if let's say the populist peak moment is over, oftentimes when they're when they leave, you have countries with an increased feeling of a democratic deficit, they feel like, you know, they're they have less trust in their institutions. And I think this is something that maybe is happening on both sides of the, of the Atlantic. Um, does this sort of democratic backsliding and this feeling of, um, you know, uh, lack of efficacy in peak, uh, among the population, is that a threat to the to the uh, transatlantic relationship in the long run? So, um, I think in some ways I, I, I would maybe see it, I, I mean I, I can see I can see what you what you're saying but I for me the 
what populism actually did is increase uh, participation in democratic politics, not only by the populists, but also by those who found their arguments in one way or another, uh, dangerous, ridiculous, whatever number number of, 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 of thoughts you may have had. So in, in, a, in a sense, and then, you know, we talked mentioned earlier that perhaps there's a sort of, you're living a kind of an anti-populist moment um, uh, right now. So I think that that is, I, and I don't think, you know, we see this across the board, you know, participation in the last few European Union or European parliamentary elections went up um significantly a number of other countries went up the united states had more people vote in last year's presidential elections than ever uh and 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 even though some candidates didn't accept those votes all as legitimate and you know they went so um so we've actually seen a remarkable interest in the at least for the moment in participation now whether that is just a sort of phenomenon brought upon by some charismatic characters that entered the scene and so you know like trump or whoever uh, or whether it's 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 actually signaling something more more durable i'm i'm not sure but but i i don't think that we can at the moment um you know think about at least democratic deficit in a sense that people aren't participating and of course it's been a perennial concern or complaint across Europe um, that you know people don't bother to vote they don't bother especially to vote in European parliamentary elections um, I'm sure in the United and in the United States also I think it's the presidential elections are pretty much the only thing people vote in really large numbers for the most time um, and so this may have uh, you know let's see I'm, I'm i wouldn't be for example surprised if next year's midterm elections you will have uh, a record turnout um you know you may have not the right result you want but then that's not really the point hmm. in, the, in the end let's go to jack sure thank you for being here um so I know that a lot of people have argued that in some ways, the recent shift towards populism and polarization has been different than ones in the past, in part due to the effect of polarized media, especially social media, really driving those differences, especially strongly. And so I guess I'm curious if you think there is something fundamentally different about this movement towards populism, and if so, how that would affect the transatlantic relationship. Mm -hmm. So I clearly, I mean, the social media aspect of all of this is something that didn't exist to the, I mean, the whole technology that we have today compared to say the 1930s or something like that is, is, is massively different. I mean, it's so much easier to get fake news out there. It's so much easier to, to sell a message, to do all sorts of uh, things to sway public opinion um, these days that, um, you know, it's so much easier to get a piece of news out there said now there's dolphins back in the, the, the canals of uh, in, in Venice in the swimming in the canals because nobody's flying airplanes because of COVID things like that, which are not true, by the way, don't, don't, don't cite me on it. But, but you know, so, so it's, 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 it's been a game changer, I think, in, in, a, in a fundamental, fundamental way. So that's true. I'm not sure if the, if the, and of course, you know, different times and, and you know, different concerns and, and, and all that is, is absolutely true. Um, I'm not sure if the, the base sort of things that drive some of these movements, however, are that dramatically different in terms of what, what, what is the, the purpose is to gain popularity, hopefully gain power um and sometimes by any with any message necessary if if it, if it comes comes down to that uh and then um and 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 so and either by creating your own movement i think here i should i should by the way should, should just note that one of the big differences in terms of transatlantic populism on the two sides of the atlantic is that populism in in europe is usually usually means a new party 
it means a multi-party system. So you just create a new party and then hopefully run with it. You become the true Finns or, or, or something like that and hope you can make it. And they, you know, did, did pretty well. Whereas in the United States, in the United Kingdom, for a populist to be successful, you have to hijack an existing party. Which, uh, which of course makes makes a big difference. But um, and that may be. I mean, that's one of the unique aspects of 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 the Trump movement. I think in in the United States that in the thirties, of course, in the past, it's pretty much been a third party, and that's never. You know, if you think of Ross Perot as kind of a populist, for example, yeah. So, so that's uh, that's that. So. So yeah, I think if there's any any difference really that that's or, or sort of unique thing for, for all of this is, is that there's been a few that have gained power, um, and and they um, but they have not aside from let's say Orban in in Hungary, they have not managed to leave a, a particularly permanent imprint in the in in the system. Eleanor Ross is up next. I'm so no. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, we really appreciate it. So I was wondering about um, the growth of populism um, in other places. So we've seen this like big growth in um, the US and in Europe, but why haven't we seen a similar um, growth in like Africa or uh, potentially China as well? Or not China, um, Asia. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I, I think that's, yes. I mean, it's, it's a good, excellent question. I think the partial answer is that we have seen some of this. If you think about uh, Brazil, if you think about the Philippines. Um, so, so we've seen some what we might characterize as, as, as populist, populist leaders in, in some ways and, and, and rise to power and, and uh, you know, um, do some uh, well, what some people might consider crazy things in 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 that in that process. But the um, I think a lot of this depends really on how at a given moment you will define a what is a populist, right? Because we have you overused this term, I think, in the last few years, um, and so it's become. I remember when I was a student in the United States, um, and that was a generation ago, right? Um, in the, when I came there in the late 1980s, I was curiously finding out that if you were a liberal, you were basically a communist uh, or a socialist. And that from somebody coming from Europe, where liberal means something very different, was a bit of a revelation, the L word, right? Um, that in Ronald Reagan's America was, uh, you know, liberal and left were the same thing. Um, and, and so that I, I found. So I think the labels that we use and populism is such an easy ism to throw out uh, and, and label somebody a populist and, 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 and so forth that, or not label somebody a populist if, uh, if, if it doesn't suit, suit the purpose, that uh, it, it's been a bit overused because populism can be left, right, even center um, in, in, in some cases. And, and so I think you would find out that in African politics, you will find some plenty of leaders that you might, political leaders, you might indeed define as being populists if you use the right, right kind of criteria. So, um, so yeah, but I think my, my interest obviously in this book was to look at the Americans and the, and the Europeans. And to me, the populism in these two continents shares a lot of similarities and, and the evolution of, of the popular politics that, that go with them. Rohan. Hi, Professor. It's great to have you here. Um, uh, my question Rohan. dealt with... Oh, hi. Um, hi. I was wondering, so with like the great power conflict in Eastern Europe, like the, like the the especially the Baltic states, I was wondering whether like well, sorry, I have the, the exact wording. So um, what would you think like the long-term ramifications are of that great power conflict slash like, do you think that the U.S. has the ability to make up ground in that, in that sphere? 
in the you mean what eastern europe in, in yeah to, to, i guess to like expand like u.s influence like in eastern europe and the baltic states I, from, from 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 what i understand china's gotten like a really big head start especially when it comes to like infrastructure development or just creating general goodwill in the area mm -hmm. or i guess what, what are your thoughts on like you the, the u.s's presence in eastern europe so i think the united states has to some extent squandered its opportunity in 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 this process i think in the in the 1990s um you know the united states could have walked um, the american military whatever could have walked into any country in eastern europe and be welcomed with open arms i think that's uh, that that's that's an exaggeration but but that's sort of roughly the case um now i think 20 30 years later um, and with you know all this talk about and, and the Trump era again here didn't didn't do much 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 good for it. But even you know the Obama administration and so forth. I think the 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 concern that East Europeans in particular less so perhaps than countries that were sort of originally in in NATO and much closer long long standing ties to the United States. Their big concern is the is about the United States so called pivot to Asia. The idea that you know indeed yes it is about China, but it's not about uh, it's it's more about losing uh, the United States as a as a credible partner, and in Eastern Europe, the United States is an important. It's important to have the United States as a credible partner, in part because the historical concern about uh, about Russia, and secondly because then yes, like you rightly put out, this growing concern about about Chinese influence, but the worry I think in Eastern Europe is that that will mean less American commitment in Eastern Europe, in Europe in general, rather than more, and it will be more American commitment than pivoting towards Asia and this whole US, Australia, UK uh, nuclear submarine deal just a few weeks ago is a sort of, that's why it created so much bad press across across Europe when it when it happened. Ruthie, you're up next. Hi, thank you so much for coming to speak with us, sir. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, there are problems with my audio, but um, my question was, does rising nationalism in the US embolden far right nationalism movements in Europe and Asia? Um, Europe and Russia, sorry. And are there ties here between populism and declining industrialization in these, re in these regions? There is, um, I'm not sure if I, I caught the first part of your question, but in terms of the ties, there's certainly, I mean, populism um, or maybe populism shouldn't be the right word, more, more like the trend towards extreme solutions that, 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 you know, extreme, more extreme solutions becoming or exclude, uh, that, that exclude certain people and so forth, the attacks on, on, on so-called experts and, and, and all of these types of things have certainly become um, more prevalent because of the loss of jobs that has taken place as a consequence of you know, closing down factories, deindustrialization, as, as you put it, and, and so forth. I think that's, uh, that's, uh, uh, that, that's, that's quite clear, and I think that's why and politicians like, let's say, Donald Trump would go to, you know, places like West Virginia and talk about how wonderful it is if you can have, you know, the coal mines back or something like that, because it's a sort of a nostalgia trip um, that is, in the end, is not really realistic um, as a solution. It's just about as realistic as making Mexicans pay for the wall or, or some, you know, or whatever uh, solutions there were. But it is... A consequence that the fact that something that may to some many of us seem like crazy talk is attractive to others is of course it's it's attractive to them because oh it appeals in some level even if they don't believe it's possible because it answers certain grievances that have uh, and often these are sort of economic ones that have come out as a you know industrial you know, changes in the in the way the economy is structured um, that have taken and 
is very rapid in the last uh, last couple of decades. We have time for just one last question, and that's going to be from Caleb. Hi, yeah, thank you so much for coming to talk with us. Um, you mentioned it a little bit earlier in the talk, um, but how feasible is it, do you think, to have a pan-European like security arrangement um, without the United States playing like a leading role in that? And do you see um, European countries broadly um, accepting the role of a country like France or Germany playing a leading role, or do you think it would be more like a multilateral security arrangement? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, a really good question. So. I think, I mean, this has been, again, in the last 30 years, and, and certainly in the 1990s, this was one, this basically there are three solutions to the, you know, Europe's security in the, from, from the, from the end of the Cold War on, onwards, that were decided. One was the European option that, that you sort of online, to your, you know, Europe for Europeans, Europeans defend themselves. We've had, uh, you know, various treaties in the past, uh, the Brussels Pact and, and what have you in the, in the immediate aftermath of World War II before NATO. And, and so go back to something like that. It's still, you know, there was the European defense community and, and so forth. So that's one option. The other two are NATO, of course, the sort of not US-led um, led option. And the other one is uh, the most inclusive, which would include Russia, it would include the United States. So that's the um, basically what we have today, which is the OSCE, so the Organization Security and Cooperation in Europe. So those were the options. Um, but um, for historic reasons, for reasons of um, uh, sort of inability to come to a European agreement to a large extent. Uh, the European op option still remains, despite you know, this talk from, from France or elsewhere about strategic autonomy and, and so forth, it still remains something in the probably distant future, I, I, I would imagine. Um, and for two reasons, still because I think now there is the 70 years of reliance on the United States as the ultimate sort of where the buck stops, right? Uh, and so that has created a certain kind of dependency that Europeans would not like to accept in public, but it is it is there. The dependency, the default option basically for is, is, is to have the United States, which is why when Trump started saying all kinds of nasty things, Europeans started spending more on defense because that's what they thought he wanted. And so that's, that's what they did. So, so there is that. And so that's, that's one thing. The other thing is, is that the other historical thing, which is the Europeans still have a hard time, a hard time accepting leadership from one country. And when it comes down to defense, um, the sort of traditional Franco-German power sharing agreement doesn't, doesn't work yet. Because Germany, for historical reasons, again, for World War II, um, has, is a military uh, midget when it comes down in comparison to France, in comparison to UK, which, of course, no longer in the, in the European Union. And, and, and that also complicates, <laughs> complicates things. So, so there is um, there's then the multilateral option, but that, again, nobody has yet to define clearly what would be a truly multilateral uh, defense organization. Would it mean that Iceland and Portugal and France would have equal say? for example, on, on decision making, because then it would be, it, it would end up like the League of Nations, basically, in, in that regard. So, so I don't, I guess my short answer is no, I don't see that as an immediate option. It may be something in, in, the, in the more long term, when we're talking decades rather than years. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that, that would be my, my prediction. Well, with that, fiction. <laughs> with that great question and that enriching answer, it remains for me to only do uh, three more things. Uh, first, to thank all of you 
uh, for coming and joining us. We hope we'll see you again uh, soon at more events in the History and International Security Speakers Series, uh, of which this has been a part, and at our other events, like, for example, uh, Wendy Parker on Thursday of this week, talking about Congress in national security. Uh, my second uh, I shouldn't say job because I, I, uh, I do this sincerely is to encourage you all to pick up this book, Trax Transatlantica, America and Europe in, a, in the post-Cold War era. Uh, we've both got our copies, so what are you waiting for? Um, and uh, it, it's really, uh, I think, a, a really enjoyable read. It's a, it's a worthwhile read. Um, I found it really enriching, and I think you will too. So I, I, uh, I encourage you all to do that. And finally, it's my pleasure to thank you, UC, for making the time to be with us, um, acknowledging that the time zones did not work in your favor. Uh, and we're, we're very grateful uh, for your time and for your scholarship. Uh, and for being with, with us this afternoon. Uh, and, and with that, uh, we're adjourned. Uh, thank you all and, uh, and a good night to everyone. Thank you very much for the invitation. I really enjoyed my, my discussion with you all. Thanks a lot, Simon, and, and everybody who joined in. Thank you.